Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of MEEP members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. Live from St. Paul, Minnesota, we welcome you to another season of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers who are prepared to answer your questions and discuss important issues affecting citizens of Minnesota. Now, here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Good evening and welcome to this week's version of Your Legislators. We're delighted that you could join us tonight and we have, as we do each week, a panel of distinguished guests who will help us unravel the mysteries of St. Paul. I want to remind you that this is your program and it will be your program for all these weeks right up until whenever the legislature goes home. And because it's your program, we want you to call in with your questions or send them to us uh, electronically as instructed uh, by those fancy words that will appear at the bottom of your screen. For those of you who are particularly tech-oriented, I have a little note here that tells me to remind you that uh, you can go to our Facebook page by going to pioneer.org and click on the Facebook icon. Now, I'm not sure what you do after that, but <laughs> if you have any questions, I can put you in touch with my 17-year-old, and he knows how to do that. Um, with that, uh, with that uh, fascinating technological item out of the way, let's move to the introduction of our panel and we'll begin our conversation this evening about the issues of the day. To my immediate left, a frequent guest on our program from District 55B, Maplewood, Representative Nora Slawick. Did I pronounce that right? Yes. Oh, very good. Tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm Nora Slawick, State Representative for seven terms now. I have the southern part of Maplewood and all of the city of Oakdale. I serve on Ways and Means, Health and Human Services Finance, State Government Finance, and the Autism Task Force, as well as the Governor's uh, Early Education Advisory Council. We're delighted that you, you could join us again this week. Good to be here. Also joining us from District 23, Mankato, Senator Kathy Sharon. Those of you who are wondering about last week, we opened up with a note about uh, the late Chief Justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court. I guess you, uh, you would have some relation to that gentleman. I would I be right? Yes, I do. That's my father, was my father. But I thank you for acknowledging him last week. You, um, you come to us from Mankato, no surprise, that was, uh, that was the Chief Justice's home for many years. Tell our viewers a little bit about yourself, what you've been doing. Well, I am from Mankato, as mm -hmm. you indicated, Senate District 23, but it, it represents more than Mankato, Mankato and Blue Earth County, all of Nicola County, so that's North Mankato and St. Peter and other communities in Nicola County, and a portion of Sibley County. So it's a big geographic area that I cover. I am uh, in my second term in the legislature, I have uh, served on a variety of committees uh, this year, transportation, higher ed, and uh, always health and human services. I've also served on energy and environment in the past, and I serve on an innovations subcommittee this year that's looking at ways to streamline and reform government. And by way of background, I think you had, uh, if I'm recalling correctly, uh, you had some uh, background in municipal government too as yeah, well. Yes, 16 years uh, as the president of the Mankato City Council, which is really where I uh, got my appetite going for understanding how public policy influences the course and the direction of local communities like Mankato and North Mankato. All right, very good. Well, we're delighted that you could join us. Also joining us, and also with a little bit of a uh, municipal background, to say the least, from District 28, Red Wing, Senator John Howe. Senator Howe, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you. I, I grew up in western Minnesota, but I represent uh, Goodhue County, Wabasha County, and the northern part of Winona County. But uh, who knows what I'll represent come February 21st uh, at 1 o'clock. We'll find out. But um, I, as you mentioned, many people don't know this little-known fact that I was mayor of Red Wing, so a uh, beautiful little Red Wing uh, and a great community down there. And it's, uh, I serve on taxes, which is a great assignment. Uh, I also serve on jobs and economic growth, energy, utility, and telecommunications, and I'm the vice chair of transportation. Finally, last but certainly not least, District 21B, St. James, another frequent guest on our program, uh, and also has the uh, honor and distinction of uh, representing my mother-in-law, who lives in Springfield <laughs> and watches this program every week. So uh, <laughs> anyway, from 21B from St. James, Representative Paul Torkelson. Uh, Representative Torkelson, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Barry. I am Paul Torkelson, and uh, thanks to your mother-in-law for <laughs> watching. I appreciate it. I'm, I don't know if I do one of these, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, we certainly appreciate her watching. Uh, 
I do uh, live in Watanwan County. St. James, my hometown, is, however, not in my legislative district today. Now, that, of course, could change. As John mentioned earlier, uh, I represent my house, and my friend Bob Gunther actually represents my mailbox. That's how close, <laughs> that's how close I am to the border of my district right now. I do serve as vice chair of the Energy, Environment, and Natural Resources Committee in the House. So I serve on the energy subdivision of that committee. I serve on the Ag Committee, and I serve on a legacy committee that deals with the legacy money from the three-eighths of a cent sales tax. And I'm also on the Governor's Clean Water Council. So very active in ag and water issues at the legislature, and very happy to be here tonight. All right, well, let's jump right in. We've got viewers with questions uh, uh, from that famous community, Unidentified Town. Uh, tell, viewers, tell us where you're from. We're happy to, give, uh, happy to give credit to your community. But this viewer wants to know, why are environmental regulations so hard on businesses? And is there any, being, is there any effort being made in the legislature to uh, deal with relief uh, on some of those regulations? Now, the viewer doesn't give us any specifics, but of course, regulation's been very much front and center. Who wants to take a run at this? Well, Senator I can Sharon? begin. Yeah. Uh, I think there's two questions there. Why are they tough on businesses? Uh, uh, and and uh, there, there's a, there, as lawyers would say, there's an assumption in that sentence. <laughs> yes, but anyway, that's yes. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, and I think that that would be one of the things that I would mm -hmm. say that uh, businesses uh, um, want to do business and they want as few barriers in the way of making money and giving money into the hands of their stockholders as possible. The fewer the barriers they are, the more streamlined it is, the quicker and faster they are able to uh, make money and uh, compete with other areas of the country or the world that don't have similar regulations. So they have a motivation, which is to increase their income. Uh, but we as a, as a society have a responsibility to take a look at the natural resources that they use or the impact of the chemicals that they use or the impact of practices that they have in order to make certain that in the process of their being able to do good things for their stockholders or for their investors, that they, in the process of doing that, do not uh, create environmental problems, oftentimes, uh, that would uh, make it difficult for our environment to sustain itself in the long run. So it is, it is uh, a matter of trying to find the right balance between establishing um, expectations and regulations against uh, what we all share as a common interest, which is having our businesses be successful and be able to compete. In O'Berry, I think uh, we worked on this last year in Senate File 1, and I think uh, obviously we, we, we want to look at things, but I think it's a time issue. We want to we wanna have a deadline. Uh, uh, if the PCA is going to look at something, if the Department of Natural Resources is going to look at something, we want that permit permit process so businesses have certainty. Can I move forward or can I not move forward? And, and I think that's what the big issue is. I know Senator Sharon and I uh, serve on the Transportation Committee. Today we talked about uh, the diamond grinding uh, and whether or not they can take that uh, the water that they use for the diamond grinding and put alongside the inner slope of the, uh, of the road work. And they've been working on that for years. It adds cost to our taxpayers. Uh, of uh, one and a half times, was it one and a half times? Is that what it was? Complete and then all. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, and so, you know, they've been working on that and uh, we're trying to move that forward. We passed it out of the Transportation Committee, we referred it over to the Department of uh, the Committee on Environment uh, because we do want to make things, uh, we want to save taxpayers money, we want to do what's right for the environment, but at the same time we have to move our state forward and we need to have timelines on when somebody can either be said yes, this will work, or no, it won't work. Senator Sharon, you wanted to follow up on that, I think? Uh, well, I, I, would, I would agree with what's mm -hmm. being said and I would just uh, comment on the common interest that the governor had in terms of uh, expediating this permitting process that we're talking about. Mm -hmm and that, he, that he's indicated that they've been successful at uh, moving through this permitting process in uh, no more than 150 days. So there's been significant, so the listener who's asked the question mm -hmm. should know that the concern that they have has been a, has been a focus of the governors and, and they've had significant success in expediating the timing, the, how much time it takes to get through that permitting you process. You mentioned that last night during the State of the State speech. Is so I suspect your, uh, no. your, your, <laughs> your, your, your uh, constituents also have an interest in this question. Yeah, it's an area that I do spend a lot of time in. And, you know, you mentioned the time issue, but there's also an issue of 
just how our agencies work with business. Uh, a lot of times they seem to form an adversarial relationship where it's, you know, we're going to get you kind of thing. And we're trying to create an environment where it's more of a partnership between state government and the businesses that they regulate. In fact, I signed on as chief author of a bill today that would allow PCA to go into a business and do an audit where it's a kind of a non-threatening environment. They'd go through the business, identify potential of violations of their permit, allow them to fix those violations without penalty, uh, and as long as they did that in a timely manner and they weren't actually doing anything that was fraudulent, that uh, they'd then get, their, get back in shape and be in agreement with PCA as a result of that audit. Uh, I signed on as chief author of that bill just this afternoon, as a matter of fact. Representative Sloan, your thoughts? Well, I have to tell you, maybe I'll wait for the next question, because okay. this, isn't, this isn't an area I do not work in at all. All right. All, so you guys have done a great job. Let's talk a little bit about bonding. Um, this, of course, is the what we used to call the off year, the bonding year. Um, there will be a, a bonding bill, I, I gather, from our conversation in previous weeks. We have a viewer from St. Paul who wants to know, what's, what's the position on the downtown regional ballpark in the governor's bonding bill? Now, when we talk about stadiums on this program, it's been all about the Viking Stadium, but nobody has said anything about the St. Paul project. So now I guess it's time for St. Paul. Who wants to take a run of that? Well, I can see if I can get this right. I think it's not in the governor's bill. Is that correct? No, I don't it's, think it's that it's is. It's not in there. The the it governor, is in there. It is in there? Okay. The Saints Stadium? Yeah, is right. That okay. is so part to clarify what of, it is, I believe, okay. part of the governor's bond. So, so the, the governor has about a $775 million bonding bill. Um, very robust. He's a big believer that he come out with a big bonding bill and it creates a lot of jobs and sustains the economy for the next several years. Um, one thing that's been in there that people have wanted in there is this St. Paul ballpark. I have to say that last year it didn't make it, um, but you know, for us who are in the East Metro, uh, Maplewood and Oakdale, we actually benefited because it was not in there. We got a regional fire training facility um, instead of Mm -hmm. one of the things being the ballpark. So so there are some other projects that, that benefited last year. This year, I, it's going to be tough. You know, it's going to be pared back. Um, we, we won't see a bill at $775 million passing, and it will be significantly smaller. So there's going to be some sacrifices, and I'm not sure if the ballpark will be one of those. Senator Sharon, any thoughts on the bonding bill? Well, I, I think that uh, the bonding bill is an opportunity to do a short-term jobs creation and that because of the low interest rate and the ability because of those low interest rates for our, uh, stretching the dollar, we ought to do as much as we possibly can. That there's a number of assets that we have at our universities, the capital itself needing investment, uh, people needing work, those things coming together, good uh, interest rates, ability to get more done for the same dollar, uh, the need for people to have jobs that uh, as the governor said last night, uh, the sooner we're able to come to an agreement on a target, what the size, uh, get a discussion going about what is in that bill, then passing it and moving it out so that people can get back to work. Senator Howe? Well, I think you heard a couple of things from the, the little mixed messages from the governor on that. He, one breath he says we can't borrow anymore. You know, we can't borrow to fix our budget. We can't borrow. And then he says he wants a $775 million dollar bonding bill, which didn't include the 250 or $240 million for the capital, too. So now you're talking over a billion dollar bonding bill. Um, you know, I, I don't, we, we need to see what the taxpayers can, can handle and what, what, what we can handle as far as future debt. Um, you know, we can't just continue to spend money. You see what's happening overseas with uh, Greece. We don't want to be uh, in, in any kind of, you see what's happening at the federal government with our unfunded uh, liabilities and, and uh, 14 trillion dollars in debt, 117 trillion dollars in unfunded uh, uh, liabilities. We can't just continue to spend. So, uh, for me personally, I'll support public infrastructure, bridges, roads, bonding for that. I'll, I'll support public safety, uh, but um, you know some of these other projects. Uh, that's not a need; it's a want. You know, can I just say what the, what the governor was saying about borrowing was you borrowed against the school kids of the state to, to, to take care of what was the state shutdown. That's what uh -huh. those are two different kinds of borrowing, bonding, borrowing, and then borrowing against schools. I think that's what the government. Well, the government governor also said that, you know, that, uh, you know, he's taking credit for the uh, surplus. And uh, let's face it, if we raise taxes for a billion dollars more, that would have been the automatic spending would have been thirty nine billion dollars. Would our economy handled that? Would we have handled it? Would we be in the financial position we are today 
had we went along with the automatic spending increases that were in our budget. So, you know, you can't just take credit, oh, wow, look, we're, we've got a surplus now. We got a surplus because there were some really tough negotiations that went on. I, th I think he was making jest of that, that the Republicans are taking credit for the surplus, not as much as he was taking well, credit Well, you know, for it. Here, here, here's the, the facts of that is that revenues are not up. Projected revenues are actually lower than what we projected them at. You know why we have a surplus? Is because government spending is down even further. So we've bent the cost of government spending. That's why we have a surplus. I, I thought well, it was because uh, health care and not as many people applying for health care. It, it's well, government spending, exactly. I, I think that the, uh, the issue of debt or borrowing that, we're t that we started to talk about uh, and Senator Howe was talking about and what the governor talked about last night, we need to be clear with people who are listening. The difference between the kind of borrowing that does that was done in the budget last year, which was for ongoing operations. Uh, so for legislators to say they're opposed to borrowing this year when borrowing was done not only through a shift to the K-12 education, but borrowing against future general fund revenue mm -hmm. through the tobacco bond sales right. to pay for ongoing operating expenses. Then to come back this year and say, oh, we shouldn't borrow money, shouldn't increase debt for the kind of borrowing that's appropriate to do, and that's for the capital investments. It's the difference between using your credit card last year to pay for the heat in the house or to pay for the food on the table, or the borrowing this year to use the credit card for uh, buying a house or buying a car. There's a difference between where it's appropriate to borrow. Businesses borrow all the time in order to grow their business and grow their economy. So uh, the, just a blanket statement that uh, borrowing isn't good from a group of people who just borrowed an awful lot of money to balance a budget last year is terribly disingenuous and mis misinforms the public. Well, talking about misinformation, calling the school shift borrowing is really misinformation. The school shift has been used time after time by both parties over many years to just shift some of the school's revenue into the next biennium. It's a way of, it's a mechanism for balancing the budget. It's not one I particularly like, but to, to, to describe that as borrowing, I think, is inappropriate. Well, I don't um, think it's inappropriate because Who did schools, we borrow it from? We, we kept the money, and the schools are now borrowing money in order to cover their costs. Not all schools are borrowing And money. they are having to pay interest. And we gave each, each school me, $50 per student Please. to cover that cost. Uh, and which hardly covers the costs of, what it, of the inflating costs of what are happening in the school districts. So you ask the school districts whether or not they consider the fact that we withheld their money, borrowing money from them and from their problem-solving process. They would say, you have borrowed that. The difference is that we're, we've made a promise that we would be capable of paying that back. That's the difference between uh, all other kinds of changes that we made in the legislature last year. Well, the fact is the school shift has been used many, many times in the past. I don't disagree. And it's taken up to 10 years to pay that back in the past. We're hoping that that won't take nearly that long this and time. And I don't disagree with you that it has been I'd done like in the past. I'd like to get back to the bonding bill, which is the original question here. But, well, let me just complete, though. There's a difference between saying that when you're talking, when you, when you really misdirected the discussion about K-12 education, what I was talking about is that borrowing occurred in the budgetary year for operating expenses. Right. And to come back this year and say somehow now borrowing is inappropriate when it is the kind of borrowing we traditionally and have always done to maintain our facilities, our universities, uh, that is what I'm saying is disingenuous. The governor is the one who wanted the extra $1.5 billion. And Representative Solwick brought up the, the, uh, the, the you know, you, talking about education and balancing on the backs of uh, education. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, you've taken credit for saying that we protected K-12 through education and we solved a $3 billion deficit. So, you know, uh, uh, we just need to put some things in perspective. Tor Representative Torkelson, bonding bill. <laughs> well, I, I didn't ever get there. Well, that's, I, that's what, <laughs> we're going to give you a chance now. I have this never is your opportunity. About, uh, <laughs> never say anything about the bonding bill being inappropriate. Uh, you, I don't know where you came up with that. But uh, the question of the, of the bonding bill is, what is the appropriate size of a bonding bill? You know, taking on too much debt is what we need to avoid. It's what's happened, been a big problem for many of our citizens. Uh, we look at the housing problem. But really, the housing problem is that citizens took on too much debt. We can't do that with state government. We need to take, I think, a reasonable size bonding bill is appropriate this year. But we have to remember that we did a quite large bonding bill last year which is not traditional, but we did it 
at the request of the governor that so that uh, we could get some projects moving. So a moderate sized bonding bill is appropriate this year. I don't think it's inappropriate at all. The uh, one thing the governor did leave out is RIM funding, uh, reinvest in Minnesota funding. It's funding that uh, if we bond for that, it brings in federal dollars. I believe at about a six to four match. Uh, those federal dollars are gonna probably be disappearing in the near future and I strongly support uh, doing that RIM program. In fact, I'm the chief author there. Um, there was a, this is kind of an inside baseball uh, question, um, maybe appropriate since we talked about the Saints Stadium, but <laughs> the, the governor made a reference last night to um, remodeling or repairing the Capitol, uh, which uh, I, th I think it's relatively undisputed that there are some things that need to be done. Is that topic on the agenda for this year? Senator Howell, let's start with you. Well, um, you know, I don't know if it's on the agenda for, for this year. Certainly we'll discuss it. I did have a bill that, uh, to, uh, that I, I'm authored. I haven't uh, submitted it yet, but it's uh, in bill form, and that's to bring all the senators over to the state capitol. You know, I think uh, this is the first time in, uh, since we've had party designation that the Republican senators have had offices in the capitol. But I, I do think that, uh, you know, when people come to the capitol, they expect to see their representatives there, and, uh, and I would like to see us have all the senators and, and if if there's a way we need to remodel it I know the, the governor talked about everybody moving out being kicked out for four years great but I think if we remodel it when we come back we should all come back together any thoughts on that particular topic I got a couple thoughts one is uh, we are looking at the Capitol there's a commission that's been in existence for quite some time that's looking at the problems with the Capitol and the other uh, thing that's being kicked around and I support to a degree is using some of the legacy funds uh, for the capital restoration work. Uh, it certainly would be appropriate for at least for the artwork that's within the capital. Uh, I, I think our capital is a beautiful building. I'm very proud of it. I've seen a number of capitals around the country and ours is exceptional. And it's up to us to make sure that it's pre pre preserved. Um, the capital really has no constituency, but it's up to us as legislators to see that it's preserved for future generations. Any other thoughts? If not, we'll move on. We have a viewer from Pine River, Minnesota, who wants to talk about what's going on with the Timberwolf legislation that's being talked about. Um, his comment here is, we've got lots of the furry creatures around here, and it's a love-hate relationship for sure. Uh, what, uh, what, are, what lines are going to be drawn on, se on hunting seasons and so forth? Uh, who, who, who's our expert on this panel on the wolf seasons and wolf issues? Uh, I'm it afraid it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I serve on the Rescue us, please. I do serve on the Environment Committee. I'll try to make this fairly concise. Uh, the wolf has been delisted for the third time, uh, and it's my understanding that there are no groups that are going to fight this delisting this time, that it's going to go ahead. That means that the wolf is no longer looked after by the federal government, but it will be looked after by the state government. The DNR is putting together a proposal as to how we're going to do that, uh, one of the issues is whether or not there'll be a hunting season, uh, hunting and trapping, as a matter of fact, and there most likely will be. Uh, we're going to limit the number of wolves that can be taken, so there'll they'll be tags issued, but then once a ceiling has been reached of approximately 400 wolves, then the season will be over. It will include both hunting and trapping. One of the discussion items is when that season would start. There's some pressure to start that on the first day of deer season, I think that might be a little aggressive when we have, when deer season starts, we have hundreds of thousands of hunters all in the field at once, and I think we want to be a little conservative this first go around especially, so maybe delay that start, uh, and then start a hunting and trapping season uh, that would be appropriate. The DNR is, has got this under control, and I look forward to uh, managing the wolf herd just as we manage many other species here in the state of Minnesota. I think we all acknowledge your expertise and we'll move on. <laughs> but we have several viewers who want to know about uh, what, if anything, is going to happen in the area of local government aid. Uh, and we have a viewer from Bemidji who's very concerned about Rep Representative David's tax bill, uh, proposing a local property tax cap and freezing of LGA and, and eventually eliminating the formula. This viewer is opposed to that, thinks it's uh, not good for communities, particularly like Bemidji, that has 52% tax exempt property. LGA um, and perhaps Representative David's bill to the extent uh, we can discuss that. 
And he, who wants to start? Senator, I'll start with you, former, well, former mayor. It, absolutely. Uh, you know, local government aid, that's what LGA stands for. And uh, right now we have no controls on it. It can be used for whatever you want to use it for. If you want to put in a swimming pool, whatever you want to do. Uh, I think uh, everyone in our state deserves a certain basic level of essential services aid, whether it's police or fire protection, roads, sewer, water. Uh, but as far as just any time we get into this program where we're going to take a pool of money, come up with a formula, and redistribute it, we run into a lot of problems. And, and, and for the most part, what LGA does, there's some good that happens. But for the most part, it masks the true cost of providing government services in that community. And when that community has to be forced to make a decision, do we raise taxes or what services do we look at, they may find out their community isn't willing to support having their taxes raised or that maybe they don't want those services. <clears throat> but when we just throw dollars around and we throw money, uh, it's not a good plan when we try and redistribute. We always run into problems. We talked today in the tax committee uh, about the, the disparity, the, the, um, the uh, disparity money that any, in, in the metropolitan area here from 1971, any growth in tax and in commercial and industrial business tax, 40% of that goes into a pool, pool and then we redistribute it. And so you've got net contributors and then you've got, you know, net receivers. The viewer from Elbert Lake wants to know, what's, is, is there going to be some legislative action with LGA this year? And if so, what would that be? Do you have any I, No, there's not going to be. Uh, we may do adjust something, but uh, LGA, is, it wasn't cut last year. Everybody talks about it being cut last year. It wasn't. Uh, you know, the 2011 uh, funding level is the same as 2010. It's going to be the same in 2012, and it's going to be the same in 2013. And you've got communities that are out there saying, oh, I've been cut. We've been cut in LGA. No, they're talking about projected increases that they thought they were going to get. Uh, but LGA is at the same funding level from 2010 all the way through 2013. Now, what becomes of it after that? We'll see. Representative Slavik? Well, you know, I, I am from the metro area, so mm -hmm. my cities, uh, Oakdale and Maplewood, aren't getting any LGA. I mean, so we're not, not in the pool. I would say that there, there is not going to be a lot of action. It's not a budget year. It's a bonding year. Um, mm -hmm. We do have um, uh, two TIF um, properties in Oakdale that are up for a TIF re-extension. Mm -hmm. And so because of the real estate market's been slow and be, with banking has been slower than thought, then we need an extension on that. So we do hope that there's some kind of a tax bill that comes out because there are cities like Oakdale that need that and there's no cost to the state. So there's things we can do with, for no cost that I hope we definitely will be doing. Um, so some kind of tax bill, but not sure what it's going to look like. Senator? Well, I think I've just added to the discussion that the local government aids or other kinds of redistribution formulas that are always difficult. It's true in school aid. It's true any time the state collects revenue and then through formulas redistributes it through the state. Uh, that is, that's where a lot of focus is placed on what's a fair redistribution of resources. But the concept behind local government aids is a property tax equalization concept recognizing that the capacity of properties throughout the states is not the same for raising revenue. And that's true for, for school functions and that's true for municipal functions or for uh, the ability to carry out other uh, services at local government level. And uh, the threat when we start dealing with uh, local government aid as those who are getting it or those who aren't getting it, and because I'm not getting any, uh, it's a problem. We should get rid of local government aid. We lose track of the value that there is in having a redistribution of resources to have the state share in a partnership with its municipal governments uh, to uh, provide property tax equalization so communities throughout the state can uh, provide essential services. Now, I know um, Senator Howe talked about uh, the misuse of local government aids if people do that, but money when it's redistributed is fungible. You know, you can you can uh, uh, have a hard time making certain that resources are spent the way they're intended to. But I don't think that we should threaten local government aid as a concept because the underlying principle and value is important to us, and I think we should continue to do what we can to maintain that kind of property tax equalization. If not that program, some program that replaces it. 
Representative Torkelson, your thoughts on this? Well, I, I kind of agree with Kathy and, and the concept behind local government aid when it was put into place is that wherever you are in the state of Minnesota, you expect certain services to be available, whether it be fire or ambulance or police. And not all communities have the same property tax base available to provide those services. LGA was put in place so that we can equalize those services across the state. Um, but over time, was, as with many of our state programs, it be, has become more and more complicated. I believe we need to kind of re-simplify it. I believe we should keep it in place, but uh, it's, it's difficult to make it balanced and fair, but that's what we need to look at. Uh, I should go back to the viewer's question. They were asking about Representative David's bill. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but talked about uh, caps and uh, dealing with local government aid. I, the impression I got from Senator Howe is probably not a lot of legislation is going to pass in this area this year. That is a House bill. What's your thought? Yeah, I, I am not familiar with the David's bill, um, and I, so I really hate to comment on it. Um, I do not think we're going to see levy limits put in place uh, this year. That's been a controversial topic in the past. Uh, but I, that has also been talked about. I, I really don't know where we're going to end up, but uh, I do believe, as Senator Howe said, that the current level of LGA is safe. Uh, we have a question for one of the things I appreciate about this program are our viewers. They follow what's going on at the legislature very carefully, uh, and it's not unusual, uh, and maybe it's typical, for them to know more than, than uh, the moderator does. Um, Maybe that's a good thing. Anyway, this viewer from Bemidji says, uh, wants to, uh, has a question about uh, operating referendum levies, and I, I'm not sure I fully understand it, so I'm just going to ask it and see what our panel can do with it. House File 1860, Woodward, uh, operating referendum levy aids provided to charter schools. Should charter schools receive referendum revenue from local public school district referenda? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand that, but uh, can someone here e explain it and answer the viewer's question? Well, you know, I, I sit on health and human services, but some of the I'm familiar with education. Mm -hmm. And um, Kelby Woodward is a representative from North Build, I believe, uh, new to the legislature. And these operating referendums are always um, so somewhat controversial. As you know, a lot of schools had to go out for operating referendums last fall. Um, if in our case, uh, in North St. Paul, Maplewood, Oakdale, we had a $10 million operating referendum. If we didn't renew that, we were going to be down $10 million, which would be very serious. We've had a number of cuts over a number of years. Some districts decided to increase that, et cetera, et cetera. We passed ours. We just kept it flat and passed it. So he would like, right now, the operating levy, um, when you pass that, would go back to, to support your, your district, so District 622 in this case. He wants it also to support um, the charter schools. I'm not sure the exact formula of how much would go to the charter schools, um, but it's uh, controversial um, and and would the you know there's only so much money. So if you have 10 million dollars and you're spreading it over so much, you know, in so many schools that it takes away from some of the other schools. I think that's the the reason for the controversy. So, is the viewer want think it's a good thing or? I, my impression is the viewer does not think it's a good thing. It is not. It yeah. is not a good thing. That's what I mean. In my opinion, it would be. Um, it's it's really difficult in school finance right now already, and then to divide that pot even further um, would be very difficult. And if the viewer is on the opposite side of the question, and I mangled your opinion, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> happens. Ask the people who appear in our courtroom. Happens all the time. Um, any other any other thoughts on that issue? Uh, if not, we'll move on. Viewer from Pelican Rapids wants to know what about increasing the speed limits on all Minnesota two lane roads to 60 miles an hour. Uh, <laughs> uh, anything happening out of that legislatively? Well, yeah, we've been hearing that, haven't That's we? Right. <laughs> That's right. We we heard that at the transportation uh, committee and. Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, Senator Stump brought that forward, didn't he? Yes. Um, and his, he, you know, he, he was looking for roads that, uh, you know, state highways and U.S. routes. And uh, unfortunately, his bill said we're going to take the statutory limit up to from 55 to 60. Well, that would affect gravel roads, township roads. It would affect all these roads that aren't designed for that. Uh, one of the, you know, I offered an amendment to, to limit it just to state trunk highways. And I asked the question, what are our state trunk highways designed for? They're designed for 60 miles an hour. Um, there was another bill in transportation that had to do with, uh, you know, if you're driving 55, if you're 9 miles an hour or 
less over the speed limit, you pay the fine, it doesn't go on your record. Uh, in a 60 mile an hour zone, that doesn't happen. And, uh, the and Dimler so, Amendment, right? Right, Named right, after yeah. Former State Representative <laughs> Chuck Dimler, right. And, and so they, um, I'm, I'm thinking, who was it? Sen Senator Senja brought that in front of us, trying to move that to the 60 mile an hour zone. <laughs> so we have this problem with it, with the speed limit creep, they call it. And uh, uh, I, I do think there's places in our state where we could take it up to 60 miles an hour. Um, I, I think uh, we need to rely on the Department of Public Safety for that and, and the State Patrol. Um, but there is some traction around that. and. Uh, and, and even the evidence suggests that serious accidents and uh, fatalities, uh, if you go from 55 to 60, are not affected. In fact, the, the, the evidence suggests that there's even a slight improvement on a reduction of, of serious accidents and fatalities. So there are some roadways. Um, I'll, I'll let uh, Senator Sharon respond to that. Well, you, start, you, you started to talk about the design of the yeah. highway and uh, whether or not they have enough room on the side of the highway plays a lot of difference in terms of whether or not 60 would make sense or not. Uh, and uh, Senator Stumpf, who, who introduced this, is coming from northern Minnesota, drives long, long ways on two-lane highways and at 55 and is asking for some reconsideration and, and relief in that. And uh, But as I listened to it, I realized that what um, was going to happen is that if 60 was, you. Right now, with 55, you can go through the department and, and seek a, what I call a waiver or relief from that so that they could change it in, in a geographic area. Uh, but apparently, that the, the department consistently refuses right. to, to bring it up to 60. So that's why Senator Stump brought it forward. But then I started to realize in some of the highways in, in my area, especially on a, a highway called Highway 14 between New Ulm and, and Mankato, it would be if that it would be really not in the best interest of the community there to have to have a higher speed limit then we would have to go and get the waiver to lower it mm -hmm. and i can tell you it's much harder to lower mm -hmm. to take something from 60 to 55 than it would be to to go and try to get a waiver in the public side from 55 to 60. And, and as I told you before we started, the Chamber of uh, Commerce Group was in St. Paul today, and you're right, they think they talk a lot about Highway 14. No yeah. surprise to you, I'm yeah, sure. No, that's right. That's so what do you think, is, I will come, uh, from the two of you who've talked, is there any chance it's going to pass? I mean, is there some? Well, I talked to Senator Stump, mm -hmm. if, excuse me if I'm yeah. speaking over you. I, uh, and he is he has stepped away. Uh, yeah. Senator Howe tr made an amendment, tried to offer an amendment to, to help us try to think about how can we get where Senator Stumpf wants to go without creating other problems. And right. so he's pulled it back, is working on it. And I expect that uh, uh, he expected, as I talked to him today, that uh, working with the department, he might be able to come up with some resolution to that that would be workable. We don't want to have uh, additional cost to local governments. If we made it statutory and everybody had to go out and change all the signs, um, you know, there are places where it's appropriate and, and we should look at it. Senator Stumps, one of his points was, you know, we used to have uh, at nighttime 55, daytime 65 mm -hmm. on a lot of these 55 roads. Representative Torkelson? Well, in the House, uh, this idea that you call the Dimler Amendment is now being carried by my friend and colleague, Representative Erdahl, so we now call it the Dim Doll. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's a valid issue uh, to make these uh, things fair as far as uh, fines and stuff, and I think that's appropriate, but we need to keep safety as our utmost concern. Uh, people tend to drive a little faster than the speed limit, at least when, on the roads I drive on, so anytime you raise it, you're probably going to raise that threshold. and. Uh, safety and the speeds that these roads were designed for is the, is the most important thing. Yeah, I would say, you know, I have teen drivers, so safety is always a concern, but I'll tell you, I was um, in Arizona and rented a car there, and it was 75 was the going rate, and so, of course, you know, people were going 80, and it was uh, pretty amazing. I mean, it was, it was a push, and the trucks are all going that fast, and um, so there are other states doing this. Um, of course, it's always hot and dry there, and we have a lot of different conditions here in Minnesota. Uh, that and different kinds of roads, but I think you're seeing nationwide. You know, remember how it came down? It's probably definitely creeping back up. Yeah, and I, I think that uh, what the department will say to us is what they're tracking is these these uh, statistics that show us that as you change these rates in other states as well as in our state, and of course the objective of the department is to move towards zero deaths mm -hmm. on our highways, that these kinds of changes Im can impact. The trajectory of what we're of the successes that we've been getting in bringing down 
deaths because of, the, of speeds as well as seat belts and other laws that we have in the state. Well, a viewer from Roseville, this will come as no surprise to anyone. Uh, in fact, I think it's kind of remarkable. We've gotten to, you know, about two-thirds of the way through before it comes up. But a viewer from Roseville says, what about this uh, talk about a Viking Stadium proposal? <laughs> and oh, this viewer specifically... Okay. Speci Someone's wearing purple hair. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. <laughs> There's our expert right there. Uh, our, uh, our, this viewer specifically is concerned about uh, Lanning and Rosen's proposal, but I suppose more generally uh, where this might go. Who wants to take a run at this first? We won't pick on you, Senator Sharon. Let's start with you, Representative <laughs> Carlson. You. I'd be happy to. I, I have to say on the get-go that I don't spend a lot of time on the stadium issue. I know, judging from the media coverage, you'd think that's all we do at the Capitol is worry about the Viking Stadium. Frankly, I have spent zero time in, in committee or on the floor worrying about the Vikings. However, <laughs> it's a topic you can't avoid because everybody's talking about it. Uh, we did find out this week that the Vikings definitely will be playing in the Metrodome for another year. I personally hope that does not take the pressure off. I think we need to keep some pressure on this issue so that we finally get to a good plan. Uh, I, there are so many plans out there that are being endorsed by so many interest groups that it's really hard to, to really evaluate anything because there's not a solid plan that involves a stadium plan and a funding plan and a location plan and puts it all into a good, tidy package that we as legislators can, can really evaluate. And until we get there, uh, it's just going to be really hard to move forward. Uh, it's going to require a strong local partner, whether that's Hennepin County or Minneapolis or Ramsey County or my favorite, uh, Shakopee. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that's just because it's close to my yeah. home, by the way. Um, a, a strong local partner needs to step forward with significant funding from some source. And, and how that all comes together, I don't know, but I do know there's a strong appetite for professional football here in the state of Minnesota. We have kind of a rugged track record with other professional sports. As you re may recall, the Lakers left Minnesota, and we finally figured out a way to get professional basketball back. The North Stars left Minnesota, and we finally figured out a way to get professional hockey back. As long as we already have professional football here and we have that track record, I think we should figure out a way to keep the Vikings here in Minnesota. I, I will say, well, I have, live in Ramsey County, so you can guess which plan <laughs> is my favorite. Is that that? Well, actually, and we have a viewer here who supports Arden Hills. Yes. I want you to talk about why that's a good idea, uh, and how it can be done, and so forth. Arden Hills is a wonderful site, and I was able to go out and tour that with uh, Commissioner Bennett uh, and see what it's all about. It's a huge piece of land um, where you can not only have a stadium, you can also, as we all know, have a real estate development. Um, it would be a great place and for tailgating and for the type of space that the Vikings need. As we know in Minneapolis, it's been kind of crowded down there. Um, but the drawback is the infrastructure. They would have to really do a lot of building on that. Um, Ramsey County came up with a good package. Um, they have a lot of ideas on how to do this. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to see that move forward. I think um, with Representative Torkelson's point, um, the most likely funding source probably from the state, it looks like e-pull tabs. Um, which, you know, it's, it's controversial, but not as controversial as some of the other forms of gaming. Um, so there's, there's some members where there might be able to be a coalition of members that would support that. Um, and we hear it's coming out maybe as early as next Monday or Tuesday. I mean, that's what we're hearing. And so we're, we're preparing a little thing on, uh, for folks that support early childhood at that, you know, what if um, for early childhood for this, this ETAB funding, if we could get 30% of that? Or what if you tie the Vikings to a good cause? Uh, so that, that would be my thing. <laughs> Get enough people involved in sharing the money and it'll pass. Well, you never know. And I, I think that there is a need for little kids getting ready for kindergarten. And uh, maybe the idea and the time has come to, to tie the two together. We shall see. I think there'll be a lot of people with the same idea. Um, so we'll have some amendments maybe go on and some amendments come off. But I think ultimately we may pass a Viking Stadium. We do not spend a lot of time on it. Um, either in the House, uh, and, and if there is a bill, it's going to move very quickly. Senator Sharon? Well, I, I don't think I can add to this discussion, uh, excepting that my favorite site, since Mankato hasn't made its proposal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Duluth surfaced. What's wrong with the people in Mankato? Say Duluth, just to what be is the funny? chamber doing Duluth. walking around the Capitol? They should be working on this. <laughs> but... Um, I, I am surprised to hear about the notion that there would be something in front of us as early as next week. I have not heard that. Uh, uh, if that happens, it happens. But 
uh, Representative Torkelson uh, makes the point that I really believe that if we are going to do this, I think we have to make certain it's a very good plan and that it has not only real, the, the relief that we all want from having so much attention and that the, that, that pressure needs to be on because it forces us to the decision, but uh, the, the concern I have is that in the pressure to make a decision that we don't uh, solve the problems that we need to on the long-term vision about what's best for this stadium and not just this stadium but other sports facilities I hope that in the process of uh, coming up with a solution for the Vikings that we uh, think about how are we going to deal long term with the depreciation of the other facilities and how do we manage those long term so that we don't have to get back into this uh, repetitious cycle where we're we're um, moving from one sports facility crisis to another. Senator Howe, any thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, for me, it'll come down to a financial decision. You know, Barry, if, if, if we look at what the Vikings, just the, the actual concessions and the players, and when other teams come and play here, they pay income tax, they generate $23 million in taxes. Now, if it would be much easier if the team wasn't here and they were coming here. And then we could take that money that they generate and dedicate it towards bonding, towards the stadium, and take care of the state's share. But if you're going to take that $23 million and dedicate it to a, a, a new stadium for funding for a new stadium, you'd have to do two things. You'd have to, you know, backfill, raise fees and taxes and, and backfill that $23 million because that $23 million right now is built into our general fund. Or you're going to have to cut $23 million worth of programs. And neither uh, proposal is, is acceptable to people. So the real question is, is if, if we don't build, if we don't participate in a, in a new stadium, will the Vikings leave? If the answer is no, then we probably shouldn't uh, be involved in public financing. But if the answer is yes, that they're eventually going to leave, and I think if we don't do something soon, they are going to leave, uh, then, then we're going to lose that $23 million to our general fund anyhow. And uh, I was at the state ch uh, chamber dinner, and I, I, somebody held up a, 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 a flyer. Uh, it was a news cover, and it had Red McCombs, and I'm not sure who the other person was, but the headline said, why the Vikings need a new stadium and why they're going to get one. And you know what the date was on that? 1999. So this issue's been around for over a decade. We need to do something. Um, I, I, but again, we haven't. None of us have seen a bill yet, and so if, if there's a bill coming next week, great. Uh, I, I want to see one, and uh, and we'll go from there. Barry, I feel like I have to one comment in relation to the pull tab issue. You know, there's lots of charities all across Minnesota that benefit right now from non-electronic pull tabs, and if we expect to generate tremendous amounts of revenue from electronic pull tabs. I'm afraid we're looking at taking it away from those charities that depend on those revenues today. So I think you've got to be a little careful about the expectations from electronic pull tabs. And I think Good that point. just demonstrates why this will be complex even if a plan comes forward. Because to take all those tentacles of how it's paid, where it's located, uh, what is the size of uh, the state's share, what is the, what is the local partner share, you know, you gain and lose votes depending on what the uh, what the proposal is, mm -hmm. and to s sort of put together something that creates enough uh, support in each of the houses, I think, is a very difficult task. Viewer from Duluth wants to talk about uh, property taxes. Concerned about the level of property taxes, this viewer suggests that one possibility might be to uh, increase the sales tax uh, and reduce or eliminate property taxes. I'm not sure the tax capacity is there to do that, but in any event, I want to uh, I want to share with you his concern about property taxes, his question as to whether or not there's going to be something happening in this session, and his specific idea about perhaps. Um, reducing or eliminating uh, property taxes by uh, increasing the sales tax. Uh, any discussion on any of those points? Well, Barry, if we're going to start talking about property taxes, you better go into the second hour. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we only got eight we, minutes, so uh, <laughs> we have the most complicated property tax system in the world. Yes, we do. Uh, we have 55 different levels of, of tax of classifications. We have, you know, all these different taxing jurisdictions all over the state. When you make a change in, in the property tax, it affects each of those a little differently. And we've seen that with what happened last year. Uh, we, somebody needs to figure out a way to reform this system, make it simpler, more fair, easier to understand. I, when people come to me with their statement, I can't even explain to them what's happened. 
because it is so darn complicated. Yeah. Well, what happened with the state shutdown is there was the elimination of the Homestead Credit Act, and so people's taxes, property taxes went up. And we know that property taxes going up hurt seniors, it hurts people on fixed incomes. They don't have any money, more money to pay property taxes. But some people's property taxes went down. Wait, well, some, some people, <laughs> but I think that it, it would be interesting if we could note exactly what happened. We do know that, that, that property taxes directly hurt people. We, we want to keep people in their homes. We want to keep seniors in their homes. As far as the sales tax, I think we probably all have a different um, position on this, but I always remember back in the Ventura days, Ventura sort of uh, did this analysis of what things could be raised, and there are certain things, uh, taxes on, I think it's accountants, and there's different services that are not taxed right now that we could be taxing. Whether it's sales tax, people sometimes consider that regressive because you have people of all incomes that would be affected by a sales tax. Could the sales tax go broader? It, in my opinion, yes, it could. Um, I think we should do an overhaul of the, t the tax system and not, not just tinker around the edges. But really what you have to look at, you have to look at a progressive system. In our progressive system, what you go back to is the income tax. The people making the most should be paying the most. It's not those people in there, they're in their homes, they're on fixed incomes, their property taxes are going up. It's not working the way it is. And in particular, that elimination in the final deal of that, that the Republicans uh, led legislature made is is it increased property taxes? Well, I, I think we, we we need to move away from such a heavy reliance on property taxes and and income taxes. And our our system is very progressive. Um, the people at the top pay the most. They they are shouldering the burden. We get into this these percentages, and that doesn't tell the whole story. That tells part of the story when you just look at the percentage of what somebody's paying and not the dollars or the percent of a burden that they're paying. Um, we're not going to have any any significant change in our tax policy. We might position some things this year, uh, but it, it's an election year, so there's not going to be any real changes done oh. on it. But last year when we had the government shutdown, I worked with uh, Commissioner Franz. I worked with the governor. I wanted to expand our sales tax, and, and we should we should move towards more of a consumption tax. We have it just about exactly backwards. We should encourage investing, earning, and savings, and, and, and we should tax consumption. Back when we went to... We want on our sales tax, we only tax uh, goods. We don't tax services. Twenty years ago, almost 70 percent of everything we bought was goods. Today, it's 30 percent, and 70 percent of what we spend our money on is services. We could, get, we could expand our sales tax to goods and services. We could lower our overall rate by almost two percentage points, put us in more of a competitive line with our neighboring states when it comes to sales tax, and we could move on the income tax to a flat 7% tax and exempt the first $30,000 of everyone's income, regardless of what you make. And that would help with the progressivity. And that would work. Uh, uh, but uh, last year it didn't work. Uh, and, and I know Myron Franz is going around with his uh, Commissioner Franz, who's Commissioner of Revenue. He's got a three-legged stool tour uh, that he's going around. And, and he shows that 20 years ago that three-legged stool kind of sat forward. Now we've got this one long uh, uh, leg on that, and that's property tax. And when he sets it up, it falls over. It's a great effect. And uh, I, I don't really care whether the stool stands up or not. I just want to rename the lakes because I think the longest one should be the consumption tax. Senator? Well, I, uh, I think that the, uh, there's much to be said about this. I agree with the fact that we need to have really serious discussion about tax reform and a, a change in the overway in which we collect revenue at the state level. Uh, I, I believe that property taxes is, is absolutely the most regressive tax because if you're in a small business and you... Uh, don't make a profit this year or you lose income because the economy is down and your property taxes go up, it doesn't make any difference. Or if you're on a fixed income uh, and your property taxes go up, it simply doesn't make any difference. They're going to go up whether you're mm -hmm. on fixed income or not. Uh, so it is reg that's what we mean when we say it's regressive. It's not sensitive to, to those kinds of things. Um, consumption tax, I think, needs to be a part of the package. But we have to remember that some consumers are then uh, given barriers to access to the courts, for example, or access to getting good legal services or getting access to other kinds of services that we'd now be taxing. But the commissioner mm -hmm. has indicated that if you look at what is our economy, uh, where is our economy growing, it's in services that are not taxed as opposed to goods. 
Uh, and the only service that we're taxing, at least right now, are, are medical services. That is a service. But uh, the idea of expanding it to other services, I think, deserves serious dialogue as long as we look at the increasing regressivity of that. And then the, the least regressive, of course, is income tax. And then the final thing, if you don't mind, I'd like to say is the, the it wasn't just the homestead credit, credit elimination that was the issue. It was the exclusion that went along with that that was problematic, at least for the, uh, uh, the people in my Senate district. Because the exclusion required communities to continue to give a property tax break to some properties. But in the past, the state has sent money along with that exclusion and partnered with municipalities to give that property tax break. This time they required a, a level of exclusion but didn't send any money along with it. And that's what created the, uh, the requirement on the municipalities to either significantly cut services that they'd been cutting for a long period of time or to raise property taxes on all properties. Viewer uh, wants to know, what about a state-run casino? Is that on the table anywhere? We've only got about a minute left. Anybody want to take a run at that? No, well, it's on the table at uh, the White Earth Indian Reservation, but I don't think it's going to get very far. Any thoughts on, um, we have, uh, we get to this time in the session, there's some discussion about when we might go home. Any thoughts about when the session <laughs> might end? Anybody want to make venture prediction? Let's start with our veteran legislator. Well, they just scheduled a spring break uh, yeah. over the Easter, so I guess we're taking a spring break. I just assume, and I'm hoping now, I'll, I'll take bets on um, April 30th. April 30th. Any other thoughts? I, I don't plan to take the spring break. Uh, my wife and the kids uh, are trying to plan a vacation. I said, uh, you know, I might be able to meet up with you somewhere. We'll see. We had a question about uh, dry cast storage. Is there anything moving on that? I'll just say, I look at you because you're yeah. Red Wing. Any, is there anything happening on that? We only have a few seconds. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to continue to work on dry cast storage. You know, one of the things we're going to lo learn from Fukushima is the real danger zone is with the fuel cells that are in the storage pool, the, the cooling pool. We need to more, have more dry cast storage. But again, we have to keep up the pressure on the federal government to have a national repository. All right, that's going to be our final word for tonight. I want to thank all of you for joining us. I want to thank you, the viewers, for being with us. This is your program. We look forward to having you back with us again next week and all the weeks for follow until the legislature goes home. Thank you and good night. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org. Find out more about the history of the program, who's been a guest, and watch all our past episodes. There's also a photo gallery, informative links, and much more. You can also get involved and stay in touch by following us on Twitter and join the discussion on our Facebook page. Thank you for watching Your Legislators. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of MEEP members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans.